do that. I just had to one-up Susie just a little bit. I actually won an iPad in a dance-off with that move. So I, I, I pull it out whenever I feel like it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Susie, for inviting me to speak. Susie's never heard me speak. That was a very brave move. And thank you all. You're about to give me half an hour of your lives. You will never get this half an hour back. And so I need to use it wisely, and I want to make sure that you enjoy yourself, that you learn some stuff, you laugh a bit, and you, um, uh, most importantly, remember this half an hour. That's my job. Uh, I've been, oh, I learned about this event called Fearless, and I thought, that sounds awesome. I want to go to that thing. And then I met Susie, and she invited me to speak. And she said, but we want you to speak on courage. And I just thought, what? How am I qualified to speak about courage? I have never jumped out of a plane into a war zone. I've never stood in front of a firing squad. I've never had to walk out of a violent marriage. I've only been ballsy or courageous in a, in a corporate sense, or maybe in a hairdressing sense. <laughs> but but that's, <laughs> that's really about where my, my courage lands. But I, I'm guessing that's probably the experience for a lot of you. There's, there's probably not a lot of plain divers in the room, although I know we do have one. Uh, so, I, look, today I'm going to share with you just some of my experiences, a bit of my career trajectory. If I can't be an inspiration, I can at least be a horrible warning. <laughs> so, <laughs> just a quick snapshot about me. I left school and uh, my parents were really strict. I wasn't allowed to go to schoolies, so I went and worked as a Jillaroo. And nothing knocks the princess out of a girl who went to a private girls' school than working as a Jillaroo on a farm. Uh, I laid, uh, laid fences, drove a tractor. It was absolutely fantastic. And when I'm Prime Minister, every kid, when they leave school... <laughs> that sounded like a policy statement, didn't it? Every kid, when they leave school, will spend a year working in primary industry. It's the best. Getting your hands dirty, riding horses, building fences. I still look at a row of fences as a thing of beauty. <laughs> Uh, then I, I, let, I did that for a while and then I, I went to uni and I'd worked too hard at school. I wasn't ready for academics and I dropped out of uni and I got a fabulous job in an advertising agency. And I was in that role for only about eight months when I had a massive motorcycle accident. And this was not a very clever business model. I had the motorcycle to get to the nightclub job on the weekends, but I had the nightclub job on the weekends to pay for the motorcycle. <laughs> and I had this massive stack really close to here, just on the approach to the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and broke my leg really badly. And I was in and out of hospital for 12 months. I had 14 reconstructive operations. I nearly lost my leg. I had artery grafts, tissue grafts, skin grafts, bone grafts, the works. In the end, what saved my right leg, yeah, I got to keep it. Just there you go. Um, in the end, what saved my right leg was my left leg. They grafted the, the uh, calf from my left leg to the shin on my right leg. So they sewed my legs together, which is really ironic for a highly promiscuous 19-year-old. <laughs> I was a mermaid for a month, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, then they, and then they separated them, and we all stared, and my right leg stayed pink, and I got to keep it. But in that year, far out, I had, there was no internet, almost no daytime TV. There was nothing to do. And in that year, I really started to think about what I would do next. I knew I wouldn't be able to work in an ad agency. I wouldn't be able to run around and, and be the gopher that I was. I'd have to start my own thing. So that accident actually pushed me into the entrepreneurial life I've led. And I began a little creative services firm. And I ran that for 20 years. As, as part of that, I, um, I developed the world's first childbirth education program just for men. And it's run in pubs all over Australia. Uh, and that was a fab little side thing I did. I'm still proud of the fact that I'm the only person who's ever got hospitals to promote pubs. <laughs> Uh, so, I ran the creative services firm for years. I had three kids while I did that. It was a great way to make a living. And then I made the leap. I was picked out of the ranks of volunteers and appointed to the CEO of a major charity. And I had to fund a network of hospitals and a midwifery school in Ethiopia. And my communication skills were exactly what I needed for that role. It was an amazing three years, one hell of a ride. Uh, raised seven million dollars in two and a half years. And now I'm in a completely new role, a different cause. I work for one of the most amazing humanitarians in the world, Geraldine Cox. 
She has bright orange hair. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> we look ridiculous together. <laughs> So that, that, that's pretty much, in a nutshell, my career trajectory. And I stand here before you with some things to tell you about um, taking risks, fearlessness, courage, uh, bravery, pluck, um, the things I've had to learn along the way. Um, if I can dive straight in and say the one thing I want you to remember from my speech today, the one and only thing, if this is it, let this be it. The sooner that I stop caring what people think of me, the faster I flew. <laughs> Stacks the end. So much energy goes into caring what other people think. And it's actually a bit conceited to think that they're thinking about you. <laughs> so they're not. Just do your thing. Wear your hair how you like. Dress like a lunatic. Whatever. Who cares? Just go your path. And that has really, really served me well. I uh, first crossed paths with Geraldine Cox on the red carpet last year. We were at the same event with Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. And Geraldine was one of the few people chosen to have five minutes to chat with Angelina Jolie. And I really do believe, this is a bit of an Oprah saying, everything you want is on the other side of fear. Uh, you just have to ask. You've got to push through that fear and make that ask. And Geraldine is such a ballsy lady. And she had this time with, with Angelina Jolie and they had a chat about the work in Cambodia and there's a, a, a fabulous connection there with Angelina. And then Geraldine thought, this is my chance. This is when I can ask her. She said, can I ask you a question? And uh, Angelina Jolie's beautiful, fabulous, very personable lady. And she said, of course, you can ask me anything. So this is it. She's standing in front of the most famous woman in the Western world. And Geraldine looks up at her and said, can I kiss your husband? <laughs> <laughs> and if I had been her CEO then, I would have kicked her ass. <laughs> the opportunity, but it's actually, I thought it was a brilliant opportunity. And um, Angelina said, oh, it's fine with me if it's fine with him. And he was standing right there. And uh, so Geraldine got to pash Brad Pitt. And she goes, it was more than a peck. <laughs> and she goes, he tastes of chewy. <laughs> so you would, you would never know that. If, uh, or Geraldine certainly would never have known that if, if she wasn't willing to ask. I um, just recently was uh, in a tuk tuk in the back of a tuk tuk with Geraldine somewhere in Cambodia, and I said to her, "What is the bravest thing you've ever done?" And I've been asking people everywhere I go that same question since I knew I'd be giving you this speech. And she didn't have to think for long. She said, "Oh, it was the time that the tanks came to kill us all in 1997." And in 97, there was a military coup in Cambodia. It's a terrible history in that country, so much violence. And in 97, there was a military coup and a tank rolled onto the grounds of the orphanage she ran with about 60 children. And she said, this tank rolled on, these eight soldiers filed out and stood there with uh, automatic weapons aimed at them. And she said, it looked like a firing squad. And the kids were behind her and the kids were whimpering and wetting themselves. And she thought, this is it. This is how this ends. This is so unfair. And she said, in that moment of absolute desperate fear, she realised she had no longer had anything to lose. That it didn't matter what she did next. They were all screwed. They were, they were all going to be mowed down. And so she said she just got angry. She was just so cross that it would come to this and, and purposeless, pointless to murder them all. And so she put her hands on her hips and she looked at the commander and she goes, does your mother know what you're doing? <laughs> <sighs> I love that. It just derailed the commander and he, looked, he talked to the soldiers either side of him. They put their guns down, they got back in their stupid tank and they chuffed away. And Geraldine turned to the older kids beside her. She didn't speak very good Khmer in those days. She said, what happened there? And they said, well, Mum, apparently there's a witch in this area with bright, fiery orange hair. <laughs> and she is known for shrinking a man's penis to the size of a peanut. <laughs> and they didn't want to take a risk with you, so they just got out of here. So see, awesome hair can save your life. 
I think, though, for so many people, the, one of the biggest fears, you know, you're not going to stand, let's hope, in front of a firing squad, and neither will I, but one of the biggest fears that we face every day, in business and in our personal life, is the fear of no. The fear of rejection, the fear of not wanting to go out there. Imagine if Susie hadn't had the guts to put on this event in case it didn't sell out. There's so much of that fear of no. Although I've discovered that no is not a terminal condition. No is temporary. It's just no for now. There have been so many no's that I've gradually brought around to a yes. Remember that, um, that scene in Pretty Woman where she goes to buy the clothes and they go, no, you're too cheap and nasty, and then she comes back and goes, big mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do that one day. I love that. So don't be afraid. That fear of no uh, will never get you anywhere. And no's not a big deal. So what if someone says no? I wouldn't be with my partner right now if he'd said no, or if I was afraid of no. Uh, I had a fabulous email recently. I put a post on my Facebook page that said, Fortune favours the bold. That's all it said. And within a day, I received an email from someone I'd never met before. She said, that, that post really pushed me to send you this email. I'd been afraid to until now. She said, I would, uh, I'm an Indigenous woman working in New South Wales and I've launched a business and it's just not working. And I've, my business partner is another Indigenous woman. She's in country Victoria. And uh, I'd really, really like your help. We're in the online space, can't get this thing going. Would you, help, would you mentor me in the digital space? It's an online sex shop. And she had me at Indigenous and then she had me at sex shop. <laughs> because it is such a competitive space. Um, no one really wants to walk into a sex shop, but they might order something online discreetly, apparently. <laughs> I wouldn't know, but... Um, and it's dominated by some really big players, and so I love nothing more than helping the underdog. And it's, an, it's really easy. It's all about search engine optimization and content, and, and these two women just needed a bit of help on that level. And I kept reading the email, and uh, she said, I'm really sorry, I can't pay you in money, but I can pay you in sex toys. <laughs> And I burst out laughing and I was at home, my mum was cooking dinner for my kids and I burst out laughing and my mum comes trotting out of the kitchen and says, what's so funny? My mum's a Baptist pastor. <laughs> and I, I was still laughing at the email, I said, mum, you're getting a dildo for Christmas. <laughs> and she knows me well, she just rolled her eyes and went back to the kitchen, didn't ask any further questions. So, had that woman not had the, the guts to ask me and, and risk the no, all she was risking was me either ignoring her at worst or just saying, look, I just can't help you uh, at best. So, you know, and she got a yes, absolutely, I'm there to help you, so we're going to work on a, on a big site audit for her. Um, I really do believe, though, and this, was, this is in your program as my sort of most juicy uh, thing that I want to remember, and that's when you really know your truth, you can be your most courageous. You can't be moved when you really know your truth. And I mean that quite literally, when you actually know your shit, when you know what you're talking about, it's really hard for people uh, to, uh, to talk over you, to misguide you. But also when, you're being, when, when people are on the attack, when you absolutely know your truth, you can't be moved, you're at your, your strongest. Uh, just recently when I sealed the deal on this job with Sunrise Cambodia, I had to do a three-hour panel interview with the board of directors. Three hours, gruelling. There was not one question that they asked me that I couldn't answer truthfully and confidently and positively, an answer that I, that I loved, that I really, really believed in and that I knew to be true. Uh, I, I got grilled on why I left my last role. I got grilled on what I was going to do in the next role. I had to come up with headlines on the fly. It was, it was quite an interview. Then right at the end, uh, they said to me, or one of the directors said, uh, do you have any questions for us? And I said, actually, I do. This whole time, I've been auditioning you as my board of directors. I really only want to work with a gun team of dedicated professionals who love the cause and are here to stay. So I'd love it if you could just go around the room for me and tell me a little bit about your, your professional background, why you're on this board, why you're batshit crazy for the cause and why you intend to stay. <laughs> and it was awesome. It was a... <laughs> It was a, a, sh a real shift in the room. They all s 
sat up straight and told me their stories and, and it was really fantastic and I got the job. But I could only do that because I really knew my truth. I knew I was right for that job and I knew I'd have the most impact on that particular job. That was the one I really wanted. Uh, it, wasn't, uh, it was only a couple of weeks ago I was in this very room at an event and uh, it was an industry event and it's an industry f that's chock full of women, this particular industry. And I noticed at that event that uh, only one woman took the stage the whole night. The rest were all men behind the mic. And that bothered me a bit at the time and, and I just sent out a tweet saying it's disappointing to see so few women have a voice in this industry, at an industry event like this. And then I got a cab home and I tootled home. And within a few days, bam, my chairman had received a letter telling me that I had to delete those tweets. That, uh, that I wasn't allowed to talk about gender equality, I wasn't allowed to raise it on a pu public platform. What do you think Lucy did? <laughs> As if you could tell me to delete a tweet. No one even read the stinking tweet, but once they told me I had to delete it, well, then I had to retweet it, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> and every famous feminist I know retweeted it. And then within a few days, I was slammed with a lawyer letter saying that I would be, um, there'd be legal action against me if I didn't delete those tweets and replace them with a ridiculous statement within 48 hours. And so, has anyone heard of the Streisand effect? When you um, try to bury something, you get the absolute opposite effect. So honestly, about four people saw my original tweet. About 500,000 people saw it <laughs> after it was in the Sun Herald and the Age. So I, I raised that and the hashtag sausage fest took off. <laughs> <laughs> I raised that because I didn't set out to be brave that day, but I really felt that that was an important, uh, an important reason to stand up and be heard. Uh, and I think um, lots, of, lots of women do that. And I had so many women had my back as soon as uh, lots of women could see that I was being picked on for, for raising, I just raised a fact that there weren't enough women on that stage. So many women rallied behind me and it really did give me the strength to stand up and go, actually, no, I'm not going to delete that tweet. And actually, yeah, we just might pop that in the paper then. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was so fantastic to have so many people have my back. And I want to encourage you, not everyone is the person out the front fighting for the cause, but everyone can have someone's back so that that person can be the courageous person who takes the hit or takes the public hit um, for the cause, whatever that is. And I'm going to work with Sausage Fest. We're going to do a massive fundraiser next year called Sausage Fest. <laughs> and you can host a barbecue and raise funds for Sunrise Cambodia. I think it's the only way to turn that one around. <laughs> So I, I see that so many women are courageous for others and Susie told a brilliant story about how she leapt, left, leapt off a perfectly good bridge. But she did, it for her, she did it for someone else, not for herself. And I see that in women a lot. What I see less of is women doing something really courageous and brave and frightening for themselves. We'll do anything for our kids. Boy, have I seen people fight for their kids or for other people, but not so much for themselves. Um, I'm writing a book that's out next year and uh, there, there's a chapter on courage and I sent a draft of the chapter to the smartest friend I know and it took me weeks to write that stinking thing and she shot it back in half an hour <laughs> with a note. She said, you don't know courage until you've clicked send on an email to a male escort. And I did not know this about her. And I said, tell, tell me more. <laughs> so let's call her Susan, because that's her name. <laughs> Susan had had a 10-year sex drought, and Susan was crawling up the wall. She was, she was widowed, so she'd done her whole 40s. Man, she was just going insane. And then she read this article about the rise of male escorts. And she did a research and she, I said, how did you find this guy? She goes, you've heard of Google? <laughs> so, <laughs> so she found this dude and they spent months toing and froing and talking and covering all the, I don't know, what you ask, questions and getting to know each other. And then they had this amazing weekend together. And she, she sent me the, this dude's URL. 
And I read every word of this guy's website. The most heartbreaking were the testimonials. There were pages and pages of testimonials of women who just needed someone to tell them they were beautiful, to give them the, the courage to have a go at this sex thing. The young, the old, the overweight, couples who just didn't know how to do this thing. And I just thought, I actually found it quite touching and beautiful to read all that. And, and such bravery in every single one of those people who are willing to take that step. So Susan had this amazing weekend and she said, oh my goodness, he cooked for me. <laughs> so she went to this apartment, purpose apartment, and he cooked for her and he washed up. And they had wild mad sex and they did things I'd never even heard of. <laughs> but they had <laughs> this wonderful weekend together. And then she told me that um, she was saving up for her next encounter. <laughs> and she calls it the fuck account. And, and she said, I'm hoping for frequent fucker points because that was amazing. <laughs> but honestly, after telling me that story, Susan went from the smartest chick I know to the bravest chick I know to d really do something for herself. I'm not sure I'd have, I'd have the guts to do what she did and I thought it was fantastic and she actually never went back to see that guy because she, it just boosted her confidence enormously. She sent me a message and she said, remember ages ago you told me I had a pretty face? I went, yeah. She said, I think you're right. <laughs> That's so cool that she had come that far but she needed to really push herself through um, to have an experience like that um, for herself. But I honestly think it's the everyday heroism that makes the world go round. It's the uh, people with depression who haul their asses out of bed every day. It's uh, the people with kids with disabilities who struggle on. It's the single mums. Those chicks are heroes every single day. There's a, I met a woman who her child was born with an eye condition. She had to put contact lenses in her baby's eyes until he was 18 months old so that he his, would have properly formed um, retinas for surgery. She said, it nearly broke me, that task, every day. There's another woman I know who had her entire lower colon removed so that she, when she was only 21 years old, so that she would avoid hereditary bowel cancer. These are brave women and people doing brave things every single day. People quitting jobs to do stuff that floats their boat. People quitting their jobs and selling everything they own and travelling around the world. That is so courageous, so incredibly brave. And there's lots of you in that room today. My favourite one, though, is a woman who I said, because I've been asking everyone, what's the bravest thing you've ever done? She said, I dived over the fence of a drug dealer's house and I stole his dog because he'd been using it as a football, so I stole the dog and I rehomed it. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? But you know, there are, there's, there are women right now doing one of the bravest things in the whole world, right now, doing one of the hardest, most physically full-on painful things that you can do in the whole wide world, and that is push a human out your vagina. <laughs> So the martyr up there, there's a chick doing it right now, <laughs> I betcha. And that is a really tough job. I did it three times and far out. That is, it is the toughest physical thing I've ever done. So in the spirit of that, I'm going to leave you with a cracking birth story. <laughs> I, I have three. My second child was due on New Year's Eve. So we figured we were safe to have our usual big Christmas shindig in mid-December. And as first, the first guests arrived at that party, so did the first contractions. And my first baby had taken 24 hours from start to finish, so I figured I had plenty of time. And you know what? I had Santa coming at eight and 200 bucks worth of sausages to cook and people pouring through my front door. So I was not in my uterus. I was at the party and had to do all that. And I just kept motoring and chips and dips and just, you know, doing what you do when you're the, the hostess. But within half an hour, I could not speak through contractions. And I thought, I'm going to have to opt out. I can't do this. I was like moaning like this in the kitchen. And I thought, I've got to opt out. This, this, I can't go on. I ducked into the backyard and my, my husband was out there, the paint literally drying on the cubby house at that moment. And uh, I, I said, I, I'm going to have to opt out of the party. Can you meet me in the bathroom? Which he thought was very odd. <laughs> And I just bolted through the house. People are still pouring into my house. 
bolted through the house and I stopped off in the living room where the stereo is and I just cranked up the stereo because I was such a noisy bertha. And I thought, I need to be able to hollow the house down if this is going to happen tonight. And I cranked up the stereo and I still remember the song was My Sharona. <laughs> Awesome birth song. So I bolted into our bedroom, into the ensuite, flicked on the lights, tore my clothes off, flicked on the taps, jumped in the bath, turned around, and there was a friend of mine standing in our bathroom. And she had a little three week old in her arms. She was rocking her baby off to sleep in the cool dark of our ensuite bathroom. And she, her name's Melinda, awesome chick, and she and I had done girl guides together a million years ago. And there was this moment where we just looked each other in the eyes and, and with this thought together. How did it come to this? <laughs> and I said to her, I'm having this baby. And, and she, you know, one baby in her arms says, I'll get the midwife. Woo, she's out of there. And we had planned a home birth. We just hadn't quite got around to calling the midwife. And so Melinda bolts off to get the midwife. And, um, you know, my husband's foofing around to get from the backyard to the bathroom. So I did a few contractions on my own. You know those ones that get you up on your tippy toes? And uh, those ones where you go, fuck, I forgot those ones. Like, uh, and uh, and I did, only did two more contractions. And with that, Bruce, my husband, stands at the, turns up at the bathroom door. No clue what's going on. Turns up at the bathroom door with a beer in his hand. <laughs> and her head pops out. Right as he's there. Her head pops out. So I've got my hands up on the bathroom wall. And she's anterior position. So she's looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> he's standing there like a goose with a beer in his hand and he says, what do I do? <laughs> what do you do? Mow the lawn, you fool. <laughs> put your beer down because on the next push you're catching this baby and that's pretty much how long it took. He put the beer down and he just got in behind me and whoosh, she came out like a rocket. And uh, he, she had a really short cord and he, and he passed her underneath passed her to me and I sat down in the warm water and looked at her and she was absolutely beautiful. And the photos are perfect, so I've got a full face of makeup from the party. <laughs> <laughs> They're the best birth photos ever. So Husby staggers out into the party with blood on his arm and vernix on his t-shirt and he kills the music and no one has a clue and he goes out there and he said, I, I just delivered our baby girl. And the, the invitation had said, Lucy promises not to give birth on the night. <laughs> so people were like, oh, that's not very funny now. And then he turned to the kitchen and said, can someone get me a bowl for the placenta? <laughs> and I think it was that sort of practical application of what was going on here. And I heard a little bit of talky talk, and then I heard everyone just go, wah! <laughs> this massive roar, and then it was like central station through the bathroom. <laughs> Everyone's seen my boobs, far out. <laughs> And then the party continued. Some people freaked out and, and thought they had to give me privacy. Are you kidding me? And others were like, I'm staying till we get to meet this baby. And it was great. Someone got on the piano and Santa came up. My dad was Santa. No clue. I just had a baby. Dad comes over the back fence going, ho, ho, where is everyone? <laughs> and... Uh, the you know, party continued and midwife rocked up and she did the business then, cut the cord and all that sort of stuff. And then I had a shower, I got back, dre back dressed in the clothes I'd been wearing before I went in there and um, wrapped up our gorgeous baby and took her out into the party and had champagne. So that, that story's been told a few times on the ward in the, an obstetric injury hospital in Ethiopia. And at the end, the famous doctor says to the patients, and that's how all Australian women give birth. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for having me. I've had such a fabulous time up here. Be brave.